down those cards. Fortune tellers! Cards mean different things at different times. Do you know anything about tarot cards? Oh, <laughs> Gather around, children. Listen to the mystics. <laughs> Journey. Podcast. I'm no mystic. Welcome to the Mystic Fool's Journey Podcast. I'm Anna, and this is Ruth. Howdy! This is a tarot occult history bi-weekly podcast. Today, we're taking a deep dive into the history of tarot, talking origin stories, popular myths, and answering questions like, what were women's role in tarot throughout history? Let's dive on in, Ruth. Let's dive on in. So the history of tarot reading is pretty fascinating in general. I mean, we started a whole podcast on it, so I think we're both pretty stoked on it. Yes. (laughs) And women's involvement in it has varied across different times and cultures. Back in the day, there were some societal barriers that limited women's participation in tarot reading. It's not like they were ever completely barred from it, but they often faced discrimination and stereotypes, especially if they were fortune tellers or occult practitioners. Yeah, there's a complicated history of women getting to do anything that men were doing. (laughs) My very vague, like, not-so-nuanced summary is that anytime men who were focused on power and profits decided that, like, a field, a product, an industry was useful, you know, for power and profits, everyone else just got, like, pushed aside. And, you know, it's kind of like, hey, until we're done with this, you you can't have it, (laughs) if that makes sense. I know that's, like, a, a very gross generalization, so this is just, like, my opinion and my general feelings after looking throughout history at how this goes, but we can see how this is mirrored in tarot's documented history. You know, we've talked a lot about how men were investing in esoteric organizations. They were building up these practices and like had like curriculum and ways of studying all of this stuff and even led to the creation of modern religions like Philema. And while women were there, of course, they were studying and supporting these groups. We don't get to see their side of history documented to the same degree until we kind of reach the 20th century after we've gone through some major waves of fighting for equality. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. I'm sure there's so many people who have been lost to history for various reasons like discrimination <laughs> so sad so sad we've lost so much but we're, we're trying to dig up the stuff we do know right that's right that's right so with gen- divination in general there's also a long history of both racial and sexist discrimination that resulted in laws that we've mentioned before that targeted minorities um, women and fluid folks were often the keepers of sacred knowledge and connection to the divine and pre-industrial pre-christian and even in some cases pre-abrahamic religion those pesky laws that surfaced out of all that discrimination could not stop the esoteric and spiritual practices from thriving. So true, those darn pesky laws. Those pesky laws. In the 18th and 19th centuries, when tarot reading was all the rage, you'd mostly find traveling cardomancers and fortune tellers doing their thing. Some women were a part of that scene, but they often had to operate on the fringes of society. Talk about facing some serious challenges. Oh, yeah. Shocking to no one when you marginalize and discriminate against, like, half the population. (laughs) They're gonna figure out how to survive and earn their own living in unique ways. So because of that, like, long history of women being treated as inferior, having fewer rights, and being prohibited from education or even just having careers in general, they're gonna operate in the margins. They're gonna get creative with how they earn money and live, especially if what they want out of life it does not fall in line with whatever the societal norms are at the time. It's so interesting. I always forget just how close we are to being unable to do so many things. I think there's a meme going around right now where it's like women weren't allowed to have their own bank accounts until like 20 years ago. Well, longer than that is 2020 now. But the general gist of it is like, so go ahead, be in debt. It's it's a form of, uh, you know resilience to being dead at this point yeah it's a form of resistance it's you know what it's time for you to experience all these things yeah it's it's wild when you think we really are just kind of like one generation away from major changes like it kind of takes yeah an 80 year lifespan to like see the repercussions fully of what things have been voted on what new laws and stuff have gone into effect so you know, every generation gets to to see the uh, ramifications of what the previous generation decided, for better or worse. Mm. Truly, what a system. But things started changing in the 20th century when modern tarot movements gained steam. 
That's when women started to step into the spotlight and take on more prominent roles as tarot readers. We're talking about influential figures like Eden Gray, Rachel Pollack, Mary Kay Greer. These ladies became respected authors, teachers, and all-around badass practitioners who helped make tarot more popular and understood. Fast forward to today and women are a significant force in the world of tarot. They make up a large chunk of professional tarot readers and enthusiastic tarot lovers. You've got all kinds of organizations, communities, and online platforms dedicated to supporting and celebrating women in the tarot community. It's a place where women find empowerment, self-expression, and spiritual fulfillment through tarot reading. And, of course, men are welcome, too. <laughs> we can see why, though, given the challenges women and fluid folks face, that they often flock to or dominate these areas that didn't fall in line with societal norms. But just so you know, guys... You're welcome here too. Like everyone deserves to have that like emotional, mental, spiritual support in life. Like you should not be barred from this, but you got to be willing to tap in. Absolutely. You got to be willing to tap in. That's the thing. Compassion. That is the thing. Got to feel those emotions, man. Feel the vibes. <laughs> your intuition lead. Sure, there have been barriers and stereotypes along the way, but it's important to acknowledge the strength and resilience of women who pursued their passion for tarot reading throughout history. Tarot is open to anyone who's interested, regardless of gender. So, ladies, gentlemen, and all fine folks, let's go forth and explore the magic of tarot. Woo! Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> <laughs> Get pumped. So, we talk a lot about tarot art in this podcast, and I think it's one of the aspects of tarot that drew Anna and I into this practice in general to start. Oh, 100%. Ruth has created a tarot deck, so she's already gone through the process of, like, interpreting the cards and translating those meanings into, like, visual designs. Mm. I, in my, like, paying everyday life, <laughs> work as an art director, graphic designer, and I like to draw as a hobby. So, like, I have a personal goal of making, like, an oracle deck at some point, which would be super cool. But because both of us have either been through this process or have participated in, like, creative endeavors, we just have a massive amount of respect for all the artists and designers that take on creating these cards. It's a, it's a lot. 78 cards, so many unique pieces of artwork, and it has to be something that people can, like, resonate with because they're using it for, like, reflection and readings. Yeah, we should give them all a medal. A little plaque. You deserve one of those medals too, Ruth. Oh, thanks. You as well. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Everybody deserves a medal for just living life. You it's know? true. Your existence is valid. You don't have to do anything to prove it. So true. And while tarot artistry is a diverse and vibrant field that encompasses artists of all genders, female tarot artists have made significant contributions to the world of tarot through their unique interpretations, artistic styles, and innovative deck designs. But let's take a look back into two of the most popular tarot decks and their artists and compare the differences. Because these female tarot artists made significant contributions to the development of tarot art and symbolism, their work continues to inspire and influence tarot artists and enthusiasts today. So let's dive back into the awesome story of Lady Frida Harris and Pamela Coleman-Smith and see how they rocked the tarot world together. First up, we've got Pamela Coleman-Smith, aka Pixie. I feel like we're introducing like a boxing ring here. <laughs> I know, right? What's her what's her walkout song, you think? <laughs> Four foot eleven and hundred and forty-four pounds. Pamela right. Coleman Smith. She's gonna rock your world. <sighs> okay, so first up we've got Pamela Coleman Smith, aka Pixie. She teamed up with the famous occultist Arthur Edward Waite to create the Rider Waite Smith tarot deck back in 1910. This deck became a total sensation revolutionizing tarot with Pixie's super cool illustrations. It made tarot much more accessible and relatable to everyone. Oh yeah, we all know the Rider-Waite-Smith deck. It's the most iconic and popular deck today. Pamela is, of course, who we have to thank for the minor arcana being transformed from those like simple numeric images into these fully illustrated scenes. Most minor arcana cards at the time featured like just numerical illustrations on the pip cards like they'd literally just show three wands on the three of wands like there might be like another little symbol hiding in there somewhere but nothing like what pamela did so she drew inspiration from the sola busca deck which had a little extra visual oomph to it but they weren't as detailed as pamela's final scenic illustrations and while arthur Waite did give her specific instructions on what the major arcana should show 
Pamela was really the one responsible for interpreting his written instructions into these 78 unique illustrations, while also conceptualizing the pip cards. Unfortunately, as we have heard before, Pamela only made a flat fee off her hard work, no royalties, no licensing, and her name was often left off of the deck for a very long time. She did sneak her initials into every single card except for the fool, but her name was just left off the deck. The writer name came from the publisher, and Waite, of course, is Arthur Waite, but you know, she didn't get her credit until much later, and really until after she died, unfortunately. So lame. I know. It's the worst. Give credit, man. I know. I feel like there's so many of these stories that we cover where I'm like, hundred, like 90% of the time, I'm like, heck yeah, heck yeah, heck yeah. And then there's like a huge wall where it's like, ooh, that freaking sucks. Yeah. There's, there's always that big moment of like, and they died and no one knew who they were till 30 years later. Or like, oh, because they were a woman destitute they were destitute they were poor and you're like jeez man what happened yeah i mean sign of the times i mean i'm sure we'll say that same thing in 20 years time looking back on nowadays oh, but yeah 100 percent. thus the way of the world so now fast forward to the mid 20th century and enter lady frida harris Woo! <laughs> 60 years old. She was. She was 60 when she started this. Wife of a member of parliament. <laughs> an upper crust lady with an esoteric twist. <laughs> I feel like we're getting into like Love Island introductions now. Oh my God. That would be amazing. Or like the Bachelor limo scenes. I mean, that's the next thing, right? A reality show that involves like tarot or something. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. I'd back it. So she was an artist with a passion for the occult and happened to be tight with legendary Aleister Crowley. Crowley was all about tarot and had some mind-blowing spiritual teachings to share. So he asked Lady Harris to join forces and create a brand new tarot deck that would blow everyone's minds. Mm-hmm. And though Lady Frida Harris studied Thelema under Crowley's direction and worked through various levels of his occult order, Argentinium Astrum, she had quite the independent spirit. <laughs> One of their mutual friends introduced them to each other when Crowley was on the hunt for an artist for his Thoth deck. But throughout their correspondence with one another, Lady Frida asserted her opinions and spiritual preferences, even if they were in direct opposition to Crowley's. Like, she was just... It, her path was her own, and she was not going to let anybody step on that. Truly. Even the founder of Thelema. Yeah, exactly. As we've kind of talked before, Lady Frida's artistic style was very much influenced by the rising surrealist movement that happened post-World War I, Art Deco, and her study of projective geometry, which informs her use of lines and perspective in the cards. And voila! The Thoth tarot deck was born! Surprise! Surprise! Lady Harris poured her artistic genius into the deck, bringing Crowley's esoteric concepts to life. The deck became a symbol of Crowley's philosophy called Thelema, and it took tarot to a whole new level. Oh yeah, Pamela and Frida have very different artistic styles. So Pamela used a very flat application of this bright, vibrant colors, but very little shading, and she paired it with that really clear, definitive black line work. And Frida, with her use of like geometry and perspective and shading, created a lot of visual depth to her art. Both are, of course, filled with symbolism, but you might find that you resonate with one style or the other, or you even just pull different interpretations from the same card, simply because of how different and unique each artistic style is. So they are both incredibly important when you start looking at decks and like what you want to use personally because art the artistic style and the design is really what speaks to you is going to like bring out different meanings and associations that's learning how to view art in any context is very similar when you're starting to look at things like tarot decks you know you gotta read the vibes you gotta read your vibes read the room yeah i feel like uh picking your own tarot deck is it feels exactly like that harry potter scene where he's getting his wand oh yeah you're like and like the wand chooses the wizard it's like yeah it's true with tarot decks too yeah exactly like i've bought decks from like these are pretty but like i don't want to use them like <laughs> so, something not some the vibes are off something's not right pretty yeah don't want them <laughs> and while we're definitely not comparing these two women at all it would be impossible to do so the debate of RWS versus Thoth tarot deck has always been a prevalent topic of conversation in the tarot community. And I think one of the most interesting parts to look at when you hear about these two stories 
is how different Pixie and Harris approach the creation of their decks. Because I don't think you could have two more opposite personalities working towards creating the same product. On one hand, you have Pixie, a free-spirited woman that grew up in America and Jamaica who was underpaid and overworked during the creation of the RWS deck, not to mention she was also highly involved in the suffrage movement while simultaneously working on the deck. Oh yeah, she completed 78 illustrations for the Waitsmith deck in just six months while also volunteering her time and artistic skills to the London suffrage movement. I cannot explain to you how like horrifying the idea of like creating 78 images in only six months on top of having like a full-time job and everything else sounds to me. Like that sounds wild. Right? And her knowledge of design and how to create signage was invaluable to the local suffrage movement. So her skills were really translatable across different mediums. Yeah, just six months, man. Pro that's another that's another medal in and of itself like hey fully illustrated by hand take this trophy ma'am you can have it yeah i know she didn't like fully realize the impact that the deck had on the world in her lifetime but i just can't imagine like doing this huge thing making the tarot deck and then also fighting for women's rights at the same time it's like wait Dude, you need a vacation. I know. Maybe she needs yeah, she needs a little rest. She deserves a break. <laughs> Truly. Then on the other hand, you have Lady Frida Harris, a wife to a member of parliament, who instead of receiving pay for her art, basically paid Crowley to work on the deck. She was a Crowley disciple who let the creation of the Thoth deck totally take over and dictate every single aspect of her life. Okay, yeah. Lady Harris was in deep with Crowley. And she had this like funny sort of tense push and pull relationship with his religion, Thelema. She would consistently assert her own interpretation of the religion, even if it didn't align with Crowley. And in comparison to Pamela's six month turnaround of the tarot art, Harris took around five years to complete the artwork for the Thoth deck. She and Crowley had a lot of back and forth on some of the cards. And when Crowley and Harris worked to and when Crowley and Harris worked to define the interpretation of the cards, they often treated the deities associated with each card as if they were like a third person in the room to consult with. So, yeah, they had a very different manner of working through how to interpret everything visually. And they definitely like pulled in this idea of like, hey, Mercury is going to tell me how to do this now. Hey, this deity isn't approving of this artwork right now. So wild. What a wild way to work. Mm-hmm. And while Pixie was a clairvoyant mystic, she approached the creation of the art very pragmatically. She drew inspiration from other tarot decks and from the actual description of the cards that Waite provided her. When I was reading about her story and I was trying to like put myself in her shoes, she really did take on the perspective that this was a job. This was like, she's paid, she's being paid for this work. She had instructions from Arthur on his goals. He's basically the client. And she was still able to uniquely interpret all of these cards because she had a personal connection and spiritual practice with the Golden Dawn. But because she had this formal art career, you know, she understood like project management, timelines, deadlines, getting things like done and finished. Like she knew how to do business because her livelihood depended on it. So she clearly like was able to blend these two worlds of like the spiritual and the material. And I kind of like to think of her as like the magician in the Major Arcana. She's, yeah, she's taking all those tools and bringing it to life into a material world. That's so true, Anna. What a great comparison. Metaphors everywhere in daily life. Truly. <laughs> but pragmatism was not anywhere on Lady Harris's radar. She was very emotional and spiritual in her approach. She believed that she was talking to the deities that she was depicting and that they would actually punish her if she wasn't able to depict them to their liking. Pressure. So much pressure. Yeah, this goes back to like Harris would sometimes blame Mercury for her inability to finalize art or for setbacks in her progress. Like we have written letters of her telling Crowley, like, couldn't get it done today. Mercury. <laughs> and so like if Pamela, if we're thinking of like Pamela as like the manifester magician card, I would put Frida in the intuitive high priestess position. Nice. Of, of like the major arcana. Because like from my perspective... You know, Frida would get a little too lost in, like, the intuition finicky side of spiritualism. You know, 
a few reverse high priestess moments, if you will, <laughs> throughout her artwork and journey. Um, but obviously she did end up harnessing her inner magician to get it done and out into the world. So true. So true. So I know that we're recapping a lot in this segment, but it's always mind-blowing to me that guys like A.E. Waite and Aleister Crowley get so much credit for pushing the practice of tarot forward, when really some of their greatest works were built on the backs of some incredible women. Oh yeah, I think it's safe to say that without these women, their passion, their work ethic, and their unique artistic skills and perspective, Arthur and Alistair's ideas would not have risen to their current popularity. If they hadn't found these artists at all, we might not be talking about tarot as widely. And if they had hired completely different artists, we would have a totally different understanding of the cards. Like imagine these cards when they came out were completely different style, completely different scenes. So these two women, their art and their vision are vital to these practices and how we understand them today. Yeah, absolutely vital. And I'd also like to take some time to look at some of the most influential tarot authors and historians, because while this episode is specifically about women's role in tarot, it's not like I just Googled best books on tarot written by women and then researched them. The achievements that these authors, artists, and readers have accomplished are genderless. From a logical standpoint, these achievements are some of the biggest benchmarks in the timeline of tarot. And we can look at data points and say, okay, when this book or deck or this reader gained popularity, tarot was changed forever after that. And, and these benchmarks just so happen to be accomplished by women. And I think it's super interesting to explore the who, what, where, when, and why this was such a female-driven esoteric practice. Oh boy, yeah, there's a... There's novels that can be and probably have been written about women and gender non-conforming folk uh -huh. in this. Like, it's just, they just so much, like, rides on these unsung heroes is what I'll call them. You know, yeah. Throughout history. So, you know, the least we can do is take a look at some of, like, the modern, modern day popular um, authors and historians that have really helped pivot this whole practice. And, um, you know, hopefully we can always resurface and find more. You know, I'm hope always hoping archaeology and historians are going to dig up something more. There's always someone that got left behind in history. So first off, we got to give props to Eden Gray. Let me give you guys the lowdown on this amazing woman's journey. I think we've mentioned her a few times in passing on this pod. So let's dive in. So she was born Priscilla Partridge, and she decided to switch up her name when she moved to the big city of New York in the early 1920s. You know, you got to have that fresh start for her acting career and all. Ooh. And speaking of which, she made quite the splash in the acting scene. But then World War II came knocking, and she put her acting gig on pause to become a lab technician with the Women's Army Corps. Talk about versatility. Rising to the challenge. Rising to the challenge. We hate World Wars. <laughs> we Sorry. hate World Wars. We hate World we Wars. We do. <laughs> Unfortunately, they just happen, and then you all have to change your lives. No, oh, the whims of a few, you know, senile men. <laughs> Ugh, exhausting. But wait, there's more. She wasn't just a talented actress and lab technician. She went ahead and earned herself a doctorate of divinity degree from the First Church of Religious Science in New York. Sounds kind of impressive to me, but do you know anything more about this kind of thing, Anna? <laughs> It's not that it's not impressive. Um, I just want to clarify, as I like to do, that a doctorate of divinity is an honorary title, and it is not the same as, say, a PhD. Um, doctorate of divinity degrees are not academic, so they're not earned by going to like a set number of courses and curriculum, doing research, or writing dissertations, which is often the route you take to get a PhD. They're usually awarded as like a form of recognition of that person's dedication to their ministry, which means that there's not really a standard way of earning one. You can find religious institutions today that offer various ways of earning this title. That doesn't mean that Eden didn't put in the work. It means she was super dedicated and loyal in the eyes of the First Church of Religious Science. We just don't have a standard of like what she did to earn this degree. It's not like we can say, oh, yeah, she wrote it, wrote a dissertation and she did like 300 hours of service work or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, seems a little sus. <laughs> it seems could be sus depending on your vibe. Yeah, don't yeah, just just know that there are honorary titles where, that allow you to use the term doctor in front of your name. They aren't the same as PhDs, though. 
you know, the same way that PhDs aren't the same as like medical degrees, like there's doctors of philosophy, philosophy, and then there's like medical doctors. So in the 1950s, she decided to open up a rad bookstore. A ra so in the 1950s, she decided to open up a rad bookstore called Inspiration House Publishing. And you know what she stocked? What did she stock? Books! <laughs> books? Did she stock books, Ruth? Who saw that coming? So she stocked books on all things occult and metaphysical. That's right. She was all about spreading that esoteric knowledge. This bookstore that she created helped kick off the tarot renaissance in the 1960s. Her store was uber popular, but she was finding that many of her customers were certified tarot babies and would constantly come back to her store to gain guidance. I'm just a baby. I'm just a baby. I'm a tarot baby. <laughs> I'm not tarot baby. I don't understand. I am several years into this and still feel like a certified tarot baby. Forever the fool. <laughs> Forever. Forever the fool. <laughs> right? Dude, that'd be a sick tattoo. That would be a sick tattoo. So she decided that she'd start holding weekly lessons for all of these certified tarot babies. Call it tarot daycare. Aww. This lit a spark in the New York tarot scene that would cause the whole country to catch fire. Now here's the really cool part. In the swinging 60s, her books played a major role in sparking the modern interest in esoteric tarot. She even had a hand in shaping the iconic Wade Smith tarot deck and popularizing the Fool's Journey interpretation of the tarot trump cards. That's some serious influence. So this incredible woman made her mark in the world of tarot, acting, and beyond. Her passion and contributions continue to inspire and captivate. Kudos to her to being a total trailblazer. Oh yeah, we wouldn't have the phrase The Fool's Journey if it wasn't for Eden Gray. That specific phrase is first seen in print in her book, A Complete Guide to the Tarot. So The Fool's Journey, as I'm sure many of you know, is about how we're all the fool and the major arcana are metaphors for our journey through life. People we meet, lessons we learn, downfalls, triumphs, just general personal growth. We got a great podcast episode on that, so go check it out. So now, Anna, let me tell you about Rachel Pollock, the tarot guru. She's got some serious street cred as an author, scholar, and all-around tarot expert. Her book, 78 Degrees of Wisdom, dropped in 1980 and instantly became a modern classic. People cannot get enough of it. It's basically the Bible of tarot shaping how we see and understand those mystical cards. This is my all-time favorite book on tarot. One year for Christmas, I bought each member of my family a tarot deck and a copy of this book. That is that is dedication and a bold move. I have to know, did anybody take the bait? Anybody read it? Anybody bring it up later? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. That's so sad. It's fine. It's fine. That's how it goes with Christmas gifts, you know? It's true. Yeah, you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> It's true. So 78 Degrees of Wisdom also played a crucial role in elevating the status of tarot as a serious tool for personal and spiritual exploration by emphasizing the psychological and intuitive aspects of tarot reading. Pollock helped to reshape the perception of tarot as fortune telling and demonstrated its potential for profound insight and self-reflection. It's basically one of the first books to steer tarot away from the occult systems, and normalize it as a tool for self-exploration. Tarot went from a card game to divination to self-exploration. <laughs> I'd say self-help, but that has like a bad connotation now because of yeah. all the like, yeah, capitalism around it and exploiting people. But in my opinion, there's a ton of crossover between divination and self-reflection. It only seems natural that with like the advent of psychology as a scientific field, and the development of different therapies, we would see tools that were once used in religion and spirituality evolve to be used for personal development. Spirituality and religion were always used by humans to help them understand the world around them, their place in it, how to get through <laughs> the tough times in life. And now that we have public access to fields like the sciences, psychology, sociology, humans are going to just keep blending the old ways with the new. Yeah, I think we... Uh have the whole term of secular tarot reading now it was kind of birthed out of this book yeah definitely so there's definitely like a hey you've we've, we see now the practice of people blend it with their own spiritual practices whatever they are it's not limited to any one religion spiritual practice i mean even as like an agnostic or atheist you can use it 
as purely a tool for self-reflection and exploration. Totally. And I think Pollock's book was one of the first ones that I read that actually came from like a personal perspective and interpretation. You know, like when I was starting out, I was reading all the like, oh, what is this? The meaning of each symbol in this card, like getting real gritty and granular with it. But with this book, I was like, oh, cool. This is how this person is putting their personal spin and view on it and how they're using it in a way different than what I have seen. Like with any tarot interpretation, if, if something doesn't sit or, you know, you don't have to like take it as law. It's not meant to like dictate what the cards mean, but it adds a nice layer of another way to interpret another perspective, if you will. Yeah, hearing how another person phrases and like form sentences around these kind of like subjective like card ideas is really helpful when you're a beginner and when you're older. It it just helps you put more language to what you're feeling in the moment. Get in touch with the feels. I used this book as my tarot guidebook when I first oh, started. Oh, nice. Yeah, so I'd do a personal reading, and then I'd read from 78 Degrees of Wisdom the meanings out of her book for this. That's super cool. That makes total sense. Yeah. it was. It's the best book. I definitely hope everybody has the opportunity to read it. But Pollock's, re- but Pollock's writings are deep, man. She goes beyond the service and delves into the spiritual and psychological sides of tarot. It's all about personal growth and self-discovery with her. If you're looking for some serious insights, Rachel Pollack is your go-to guide. And of course, there are so many different kinds of tarot readers that we could cover in this next section. Because there's just like, I feel like there's just so many sections and, you know, groups of different kinds of tarot readers. It's hard to choose. Different styles. Yeah. Different, you know, I feel like we could talk about even like uh renaissance fair readers if we wanted (laughs) oh my gosh yeah and like everybody's got their yeah everyone has their own spin on it you know you have people who don't read reversals you have people who do you've got uh, you've got like just purely intuitive you have people who are super strict about like no i use these meanings of the cards no matter what very interesting i love renaissance fair readings i got a great reading from a renaissance fair reader once oh really yeah i was with alex we actually we were there together oh it was that yeah it was like the la yeah i think it was the first times we hung out so cool yeah and so we got a reading from a reader and alex was like this is ruth she reads tarot so you know just a heads up oh he like set the he set the stage to be like listen i know and so i'm there and I'm like sitting like a normal person does at the table, you know? Right. And I suppose maybe I am leaned in a little bit, but then she looks at me and she's like, your energy is very intense right now. Can you back it off? Oh and my God. And I was God. like, what? Okay, cool. Uh, what, what did you do? Did you just like sit up or did you breathe it? Like, what is it? Yeah. So I had my arms on the table. So I was just like, oh yeah, totally. And then I just leaned back. <laughs> I was like, what do I do? I can't, I don't know. I was like, what don't you like right now? I'm very confused. Suck suck your energy field back in, Ruth. Um. (laughs) So anyways, we could talk about Miss Cleo, the infamous TV personality, or maybe even Madame Blavatsky, the mystical cult leader. But today I want to talk about a card reader that wasn't technically a tarot reader but ended up carving out her own lane in the history of tarot. Mm, I do like dipping our toes outside of the realm of tarot. I think uh, I think I know who you're going to mention, and I'm super stoked. <laughs> well, so let me tell you about Madame Lenormand, the OG fortune teller extraordinaire. She was a French superstar in the late 18th and 19th centuries, rocking the cardomancy scene during the Napoleonic era. People could not get enough of her magical abilities, and she gained major fame for her predictions and card readings. She even had big shot clients like Napoleon Bonaparte, the leaders of the French Revolution like Murat, and get this, even Empress Josephine and Tsar Alexander I sought her mystical guidance. She was like the go-to card reader for the high and mighty. That is so wild to me. I mean, it's yeah, it's super interesting to think of how like world leaders and historical figures relied on things like divination and astrology. I think it's because we're probably like far enough removed from these times and from these people that we think of them as almost like other than human. Like we don't have a lot of nuance. You're like this guy like led a bunch of wars and changed the course of history or this lady like ruled her country and totally changed societal norms. Like we have to like 
condense them down so our brain kind of understands what happened in like a huge span of history. But they were just people. Like they were just like they were stressed out just like everyone else. They were hyper focused on like their goals and maintaining their status and livelihoods. And they probably had anxiety with all this pressure. So like remember like these people like, well, they've got like hot shot names in history. You're like, they probably had anxiety and depression just like everybody else. They're human. Like, you know, everybody poops, everybody dies. Like, they're across the board. They're human. And everybody cries. And everybody cries. Heck yeah, Ruth. Everybody poops, everybody dies, and everybody cries. Remember that. So true. Remember that, folks. So, you know, of course these people are talking to fortune tellers. They didn't have therapists back then. They didn't have, (laughs) like, you know, they didn't have the mental health movement like we do now. So, you know, you had a few options. You could go talk to your your priest or religious leader, you know, confess your sins and stuff. You could uh, talk to a friend who probably didn't even know as much as you did. You know, the same way we go to each other for advice. Or you talk to a fortune teller who supposedly can tell the future. So, like, those were your options for mental and emotional support during times of stress. Yeah, not great. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, yeah, it's like, oh, wow, I get it now. Yeah, apparently um, Ruth is the one who actually tuned me into this um first lady nancy reagan actually consulted with an astrologer named joan quigley yeah yeah she was like the the astrologer for the white house but mostly nancy yeah she was on staff and everything but you talk about you know all these crazy big shots having anxiety just like the rest of us that's how this lady you kind of weaseled her way into the white house because what's his face reagan Got shot. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. There was an attempt on Reagan's life. And so Nancy, of course, like, time of stress. My husband was almost murdered, and now he still has to go out and visit crowds of people. You can imagine the anxiety that comes from that kind of, like, trauma and stress. And, of course, yeah. what do we seek in times of stress? We want We want mental and emotional support. We don't have therapists, remember. So we've got astrologers. <laughs> yeah, and then her friend Merv Griffin... You know, that TV host? Oh, yeah. So he reached out to Nancy and was like, you gotta, I have this astrologer on the show all the time, and you're not going to believe it. She actually predicted that something crazy would happen to Reagan on the day he got shot. No. Oh, no. And Nancy Reagan was like, holy shit, I could have prevented it. So then this lady, Joan Quigley, uh, paid for each astrology, astrological reading she gave. But she was also on a retainer. So she was paid like $3,000 a month. But in today's money, that's $9,000 a month. Wow. So she would offer readings about what kind of events to do when, that sort of thing. So it wasn't necessarily like, oh, you know, should I fire the nukes or not? But it was like, should I do the Easter roll on this weekend or next weekend? And that sort of thing. But still, yeah, probably a misplaced Miss a bad place to place your anxieties. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It feels uh to from my perspective, it feels like uh Joan Quigley was probably using a little bit of emotional manipulation to get her way in to that. Which like she earned she earned a living, but also like you're clearly playing off of somebody's innate fears about their husband being murdered. <laughs> like Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's why it's books like Rachel Pollock's books are so awesome. To have come into play because it's so quickly that tarot readings and like love tarot readings can become predatory and if you're able to like set a solid foundation inside of yourself of why you're using this practice and what kind of needs you're fulfilling with it then then you're kind of looking out for yourself in a good way there you know yeah boundaries are good boundaries Even with yourself <laughs> yes yeah So anyways, Lenormand was the queen of cardamancy in France. She was the real deal, and her influence was off the charts. She paved the way for a whole wave of French cardamancy, becoming the ultimate cardomancer of all time. That's no small feat. Hmm, it sure isn't. I would like, I would like to have a moment of silence for all the cardomancers that paved the way for people like Lenormand, but we'll never know because they belong to minority groups, lower socioeconomic classes, or they just simply existed before anyone was recording the history of cardamancy. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I was say, like, cardamancy, it's not like it was new, but it has existed for, like, a long time. 
And there's different systems of interpretation and what cards contain, depending on like the culture and area of the world that you look at. You know, we started this podcast, obviously, specifically attempting to trace like the history of modern tarot cards. But there are so many other versions of cardomancy out there, some that we'll never know, like we said, because we just it's lost to history. But we know that like we even have like books from like the 1400s. There's this one called it's German. It's the Mainzer card. Here we go. <laughs> Do Mainzer Kartenlosbusch, <laughs> which is a deck of cards with like corresponding with a book that has like corresponding fortunes in the form of poems. So you've you've got we do have like evidence of this tracing back and there's obviously different versions of it throughout the world. But, you know, we're on we're on Lenormand because like there's like this correlation with the area and times of like tarot. And, you know, she managed to she managed to get it put on the map. So Lenormand didn't just have a brief moment of fame either. She was active for over 40 years, making waves with her cardomancy skills. But here's the kicker. She didn't just stick to fortune telling. Oh no, she went on to have a second career as a writer. Lenormand published a bunch of texts that stirred up quite the controversy. Talk about making waves. Her outspokenness and unconventional ideas got her into trouble a few times, and she even found herself behind bars a couple of times. But she never stayed locked up for long. Lenormand was too fierce to be contained. So is Lenormand like... The strength card. I feel like I already related. Yeah, like Pam- yeah. I'm like Pamela and Harris from the Magician and the High Priestess. Is she a strength card? Maybe a strength with a little bit of like devil energy. Oh yeah. <laughs> Lenormand's talents and fame knew no bounds. So after Lenormand kicked the bucket in 1843, her name became famous in the world of cardomancy. They started slapping her name on different card decks, including this one called Petite Lenormand. It's a deck of 36 cards with illustrations, and it's still super popular today. They simply call it the Lenormand cards. Yeah, we mean it when they say they slapped her name on these cards. Like, the cards that bear her name are the ones she even used. I think it was so hilarious. It's like, basically, they used her as celebrity appeal to sell new decks. And it's actually thought that, like, the cards she used were more akin to playing cards. So there's... She supposedly used a 32-card French piquet pack and then a a 36-card German pack, which looked more like what you'd think today with, like, diamonds, clubs, hearts, like that kind of thing. (laughs) And they just, like, once she died, they're like, we can sell some shit. (laughs) That's not her name. And, like, you know, here we are today. Yeah, this is, like, the George Foreman grill of tarot decks. Ooh, okay. Go on. (laughs) You know, George Foreman, what did he do? Soccer? Football? Who knows? Was he an actor? I don't know. I just know he's famous and he's got a dope grill. Boxer. Right? Oh, sure. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> Celebrity selling products. That's what we're talking about here. Oh, man. Capitalism. So this 36-card deck is one of the OG tarot-like decks. The images on the Petite Lenormand cards are simple and straightforward, depicting everyday objects, people, and symbols. Each card holds its own specific meaning and can be interpreted in various ways depending on its context in a reading. The cards are often used in combination to provide more insightful, detailed insights and answers to specific questions. The Petit Lenormand deck is renowned for its practical and direct approach to divination. It's highly regarded for its accuracy and ability to provide clear and concise readings. The deck is commonly used for personal guidance, relationship matters, decision-making, and gaining insights into various aspects of life. These days, many tarot readers combine her 36-card deck with their regular tarot decks to make a super deck. Super decks! For anyone that doesn't know, super decks are just when you combine multiple decks together. It's a handful to (laughs) shuffle. (laughs) Oh, boy. Good one! Oh, boy. But it allows for kind of like the same... If you do like multiple tarot decks, it allows for the same card to appear multiple times. Or if you're combining like the Lenormand deck or an Oracle deck with a tarot deck, then it might add another layer or new perspective for your interpretation of the card. And that pun was terrible. (laughs) Oh, terrible. (laughs) Love it. (laughs) We're on a roll. So there you have it. Lenormand was a diva in the world of cardomancy, rubbing shoulders with the powerful and causing a ruckus with her writings. She lived life on her own terms and left a mark on history that won't be forgotten. 
To this day, Lenormand remains an icon in the world of fortune telling and cartomancy. Her impact in the field cannot be overstated, and her legacy lives on through the Lenormand tarot decks that are still used today. She is a legend, no doubt about it, and the OG tarot celebrity. Okay. Well, that's it today, folks. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. If you're a fan of the podcast, we'd love for you to do this so we can find new fans. And tell your friends. Follow us on all of our socials. Our handles are our Sweet Death Inc. and Mystic Bull Tarot on all the platforms. See you later.